Beautiful or oppressive, the president's take on monuments to Confederate generals and sympathy for white supremacists drops jaws in the wake of the deadly rally in Charlottesville. Local leaders thought it worked pretty well, but NAFTA is getting a makeover. They're bracing for what comes next. And SeaWorld says it's changing with the times, but is it too late as it faces financial peril? I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer, and joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are Matt Hall, Editorial and Opinion Editor for the San Diego Union Tribune. Hi, Matt. How are, hey, you, how are you today? It's good to see you. Former LA Times reporter Tony Perry. Hi, Tony. Hi there. Glad to have you back again. Reporter Rob Nikoleski of the Union Tribune. Hi, Rob. Hi. Glad to have you here today. Hi. And reporter Lori Weisberg, who covers tourism and hospitality for the Union Tribune. Hi, Lori. Hi. A lot of Union Tribune folks today. <laughs> well, Donald Trump hopscotch from one stunning observation to the next this week, delighting neo-Nazis and KKK supporters. The president's comments following the deadly event in Charlottesville, Virginia, at a white supremacist rally sparked widespread condemnation. Here's a taste of what Trump said of the clashes over preserving a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. And, 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 and if you reported it accurately, you would say. No, George Washington was a slave owner. Was George Washington a slave owner? So will George Washington now lose his status? Are we going to take down, excuse me, are we going to take down, are we going to take down statues to George Washington? All right, Matt, you uh, read an editorial in the UT this week saying Trump's remarks were unfathomable, even, even for him. Trump at one point condemned white supremacists, then he backtracked and said there were very fine people marching. I'll ask everybody, uh, very fine people marching with the KKK and white supremacists. I think you can uh, go around uh, America and see that most people have condemned in harsh language what he said. Uh, I mean, the, anyone who hasn't seen the Vice News video, which is about 20, 21 minutes long, should. I mean, that should be required viewing for uh, an American uh, in this day and age. Uh, look, the, the, that just the, showed the sentiments of one of the leaders of it the, of it, the Yeah, the, a reporter right. was embedded, for those who haven't seen it, a reporter was basically embedded with these white nationalists, white supremacists, neo Nazis, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and, and, and they articulated why they were there. Uh, many of them said it was if they needed to be violent, they would be. Clearly, we all know now what happened. Um, it, you know, it, it would have been uh, presidential on day one for the president to say that, to single out that white nationalism, white supremacy has no place in America. Now, Tony, criticism from uh, Trump, friend and foe alike this week, but there were strong comments from all military joint chiefs of staff here. Uh, now, what did they say about Charlottesville and how unusual is this response from these military leaders? Somewhat unusual, but as Matt points out, so was what happened. Uh, certainly that, uh, that rally on uh, Friday night as shown by the Vice News. Uh, it's pretty uh, astounding. Uh, Navy, Navy Admiral first, uh, racism has no part in our, uh, our military, followed by the Marines, followed by the Army, followed uh, by the Air Force, and then the uh, Department of Defense Secretary, and, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Very unusual. On the other hand, it the, the event was very unusual. Military has issues, as we know, and the Marine Corps in particular has issues. One of the fellows who wasn't at the rally but is an organizer of the uh, white supremacists is a former Marine. Mm -hmm. And the uh, commandant uh, heard about that and within hours he was out with a statement condemning racism and saying it has no part in the Marine Corps. Honor, courage, and commitment are our values and we live by them on the, on the combat uh, venue but also at home. So he was, he was fast to do that. And there was a report an investigative report in 2009, as I remember, from the Homeland Security Department, and they were worried about what they called disgruntled military veterans being susceptible to fringe mm -hmm. groups uh, like this. So mm -hmm. it's been out there before. Timothy they, McVeigh comes to mind. Exactly, the Tim McVeigh, uh, the uh, Oklahoma City bomber, mm -hmm. uh, absolute, and some other other incidents. Now there were, Laura, and, and I want to ask our, our business folks here, um, CEOs, uh, they disbanded these advisory boards here and they, they seem to, to flee as well in, in response to this. Well, I mean, I, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't look good these days right now to be affiliated with Trump and some of the 
the kinds of statements he's making and they want to distance themselves. Whether that means suddenly there's this huge schism between big business and Trump, I don't know that it necessarily signals that, but at a time with a sensitive topic when there's such unanimity of opinion blasting Trump for his comments, um, it made no sense for them to um, stay aligned with him. It, it took some of them longer than others, but again, I don't know for the long term um, if that if that schism remains. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Trump had more fuel for his fire on Thursday morning, tweeted it's foolish to remove statues of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, are they next slave owners? We heard that in that bite from the opening and all. I think a lot of people pointed out, Matt, that, that uh, Washington and Jefferson were not Confederate generals. They weren't traitors to their country trying to bust apart the Union. Yeah, look, anyone who knows history knows that George Washington tried to unite this country, period. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Southern Confederacy uh, uh, generals, and, and, and uh, uh, we saw here um, a plaque removed in San Diego. Uh, there is a discussion to be had about whether those monuments should stay, mm -hmm. whether they should be taken down, how they should be taken down. Um, that's, that's clear. But um, what happened here is that you have the president, his position evolved so many times this week, I think, that it kind of twisted everyone in knots, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I was so exhausted last night, I, I fell asleep uh, with my clothes on, and I woke up at nine o'clock, excuse me, at 3 a.m., uh, and I was still dressed, and I was like, oh man, I gotta do this one more day, and of course, we all came in today, and Steve Bannon has right. resigned, which clearly is right. uh, kind of a cap. The top to advisor week. who came from the alt-right uh, uh, website, of course. Well, everyone can condemn Breitbart. the Nazis, and should. Uh, that rally with the, the tiki torches and all that were just so reminiscent of yeah you know, Berlin, 1933. On the issue of the statues, it gets more difficult. The, I agree. The poll I've seen yeah, by what, uh, for, done by, uh, done for folks, but NPR and Marist, 62% mm -hmm. of Americans say, leave the statues as a piece of history. Uh, I think it's 86% of Republicans, a little less of Democrats, mm -hmm. of course. So on that issue, Americans are more divided, and as Matt suggests, there ought to be a discussion. We don't have much of a discussion here. We don't have any statues. Right. Right. Yeah, I, th I think, that especially when we're talking about the statues issue, we talked about this in the newsroom just a right, couple days ago. Exactly. I think in we work were. offices, in offices all across the country, people mm -hmm. have been discussing right. this, which is always a very <laughs> difficult subject mm -hmm. to talk about, very sensitive topic. But my feeling on, on, on the statues has always been you should take a look at the statues in the context in which they were erected. Mm -hmm. So many of them were built in the 1920s when there was a revival of the Ku Klux Klan movement, mm -hmm. and then also in the 1950s and 19, early 1960s as a reaction to the Civil Rights Movement. Right. Now, if you've got a statue commemorating, a, let's say, a generic Confederate soldier in a, a southern uh, part, of, part of, the, uh, of the United States South that was erected maybe in the 1870s, 1880s, to commemorate the, the people who'd, who'd fought and died in that area, mm -hmm. that's one thing. But if it's another thing, if that was erected as a reaction mm -hmm. uh, to the, the white supremacy movement. Right. But, but, is, this, but, is, is, a, but is, this whole, is this whole focus on the statues, I mean, and, and the division of opinion, is that maybe taking away from what's really here? Yeah. It was more than about, you know, taking down yes. the statue. Right, and, and Trump's and so campaign was more than about that. And it's, exactly. it becomes a distraction right. from what the real well, issue Andrew is. Well, Andrew Young, the former mayor of uh, Atlanta, right. a uh, close advisor to Martin Luther King, has said, hey, let's not refight the Civil War. The mm -hmm. statues are things. Let's move on. Let's mm -hmm. deal with real issues of racial inequality in this in this country, a much more difficult yeah. issue yeah. to deal with than but, bringing but, some, metal, yeah. some metal down. Nuance doesn't work <laughs> these days. Indeed. Very well, well, but also this may, maybe this helps. Let's, one thing that shouldn't be lost here is that maybe this helps Trump. It certainly plays to his base. It, it you know when um, the, the marchers on on Friday who said horrible things and, and acted uh, uh, entirely inappropriately and it spilled over into the violence on, on on Saturday. The fact that those folks can play the victim card. Mm -hmm is unconscionable, but it also shows that there is an element of support in parts of this country who see in Trump, you know, something that they haven't seen in a U.S. president ever. Well, a week later, Tony? Matt, what do you think? Have both sides, both the, uh, the white nationalists and the antis, uh, been emboldened by, by what Trump has said and how well, he's I, weaved and bobbed and weaved? I weave? think so, and what you've seen... So we're looking at more of these across the country. And you've already seen tomorrow in Boston, there will be some sort of a rally uh, there's two pe planned for next weekend in the Bay Area. Tuesday, the president's coming to, Tuesday, Phoenix. President the coming to Phoenix. The Democratic mayor doesn't want him to come. Democratic mayor said, don't come. And Feel, kind fearing, of, fearing clashes. And both yeah. the New York Times yeah. and the Los Angeles Times had stories, long stories on Friday saying, 
the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area mm -hmm. is the home of the anti-fascists who are ready for battle. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're, yeah. we're in for a long, hot summer. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. And, and Tina Floyd? Fay on Saturday Night Live weekend update last night told people don't go to these rallies. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a discussion point too, is like how do you combat white nationalism? Do you get in their face and yell? Do you ignore them? Do you try to talk to them civilly? I mean, that's a, that's a difficult question. Before we leave this topic, I did want to say uh, San Diego uh, Democrat Congressman uh, Scott Peters is among many who have signed on to this petition to censure the president on the Democratic side of the House. Nancy Pelosi has endorsed that today. Is that going to get anywhere in a Republican House? I, I don't imagine so. Mm -hmm. You censure someone by going on CNN uh, or sending mm -hmm. out a tweet. Mm -hmm. uh, this other uh, metric I don't think is, is useful. Well, what I, what I am concerned about, and I think the San Diego Police Department is concerned about, is not the uh, in-the-street demonstrations pro and con. They've got a good handle on that. Yeah, we've had some litigation where the cops went too far on the Trump rally. But what happens when the border starts to be the focus? Mm -hmm. We've got a border. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have a fence. But what about yeah. prototype fences and all yeah. of that? We could be looking at something real big, not, not on streets, which is fairly containable, mm -hmm. but out where the topography mm -hmm. is different. So again, we're in for it, and we'll... I think San Diego Police Department and the other agencies have done a very good yeah. job on what we've seen last year's Trump rally, for example, uh, warning that if it goes, goes rowdy, mm -hmm. they're going to move quickly and decisively as mm -hmm. the mantra. Let's see what it looks like uh, when the border begins. Well, we'll see how these other, Boston and these other cities uh, handle it. We've got to move on, but I, I'm sure we'll be re revisiting this issue, unfortunately, as this debate continues across the country. Well, in typical understatement, Donald Trump calls NAFTA the, quote, worst trade deal ever made by any country. Others, including San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner, strongly praise the North American Free Trade Agreement. This week, negotiators from the U.S., Mexico, and Canada sat down to renegotiate the 23-year-old pact. So, Rob, start with a, a little bit of an overview. What is NAFTA? What does it do? It's the North American uh, uh, Free Trade uh, Agreement that was passed back. Actually, it was passed when Bill Clinton first became president, but it was actually worked on when George Bush the Elder was president. Mm -hmm. So it's been around for a long yeah, time. Yeah, he'd done a lot of the heavy lifting. Right. It? Yeah. it has not been updated since then. Now it will be renegotiated mm -hmm. because the Trump administration, as you mentioned, Donald Trump said that it was the wor worst uh, trade agreement ever written and wanted to uh, tear it up. But it's been very interesting because, um, uh, first of all, it's, it's, it's a massive trade agreement. It's, we're talking about one trillion dollars of, of, uh, of trade between the United States, Canada, and Mexico since it was instituted. And here in San Diego, we're talking about two, $2.1 million that goes between Tijuana and San Diego every day. So a big impact so, right here. Yeah. So it has a very large impact. Were we winners in NAFTA? Other totally. cities in the Rust Belt, the uh, upper Midwest, were losers. Were we, we winners here in San I'm Diego? I'm not sure about San Diego was a winner, but the, the numbers say that nationally, uh, there is a trade deficit, and that's the big reason why Donald Trump doesn't like it. There is a trade deficit between Mexico and the United States of about uh, six, $62.7 billion reported last year. However, NAFTA, lots of times people think about NAFTA just in terms of the United States, Mexico. NAFTA also includes Canada, and we've got a $8 billion surplus with Canada. Surplus with Canada, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think, your, I think Kevin Faulkner would tell you that NAFTA has been a win for San Diego. You know, yeah, he and, said that in the speech this week and this made week. a point to say yeah. that. When he and the mayor of Tijuana basically called on uh, uh, federal negotiators and negotiators in Canada and Mexico mm -hmm. to uh, improve NAFTA, not to scuttle it and rip mm -hmm. it up as Donald Trump has threatened repeatedly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well what's, one of the, there's many interesting topics about this, but one of the interesting things about it is Trump, you know, bashed NAFTA, but then his trade representative, Robert Lightheiser, Lightheiser um, sent a 17-page letter to Congress when they, uh, when they n notified Congress to say, we're going to renegotiate this. The 17-page letter was much more, uh, uh, the, the language w was not nearly as strident. Mm -hmm. It gave the indication they want to tweak NAFTA, not blow it up. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, on Wednesday, when the first day of the, they had the first day of negotiations, Lighthizer took on a much more... Um, Aggressive uh, role. Yes. And they're going to get this mm -hmm. done by New Year's Eve? Uh, well, they're hoping to get it done sometime before the midterm elections mm -hmm. in the United States next year and, the most importantly, the presidential elections in Mexico next year because the, the very early frontrunner in Mexico, uh, Lopez Obrador, does not like 
uh, the uh, uh, NAFTA in regards to the energy reforms, which are dramatic in Mexico. He wants to put that up for the energy reform up to a referendum among the people. Uh, yeah, b based on what we do know of what Trump and his lead negotiator would like to see tweaked mm -hmm. or, or even or modified even more significantly, what what one industry could or what a job sector could benefit if there were changes in this um, in this trade agreement? Well, that's a difficult question to answer because the auto industry has always been a very stiff critic of NAFTA. But it's there was a very good quote. I think it was in the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal quoted um, uh, a trade representative from Mexico saying that um, taking NAFTA out or saying we're going to take uh, as far as the auto industry goes, we're going to take this part out for Mexico and this part out for the United States and this part out for Canada. He says it was trying to unscramble an egg. Once that egg is scrambled and things are are, mm -hmm. are flowing there, it's very difficult to make that uh, to, to make that extraction. It's true though that, that uh, the border is a very very small part of the San Diego economy, as important as it is, but in terms of the reality of how big this county is, how big our economy is. The border is pretty small. As I remember it, it's down a couple of percents when uh, one of my colleagues did a piece on it. Am I, is that changed? Not as far as I know, but me, me, when you talk to Mayor Faulkner and you talk to some of the people here and the businesses here in San Diego who don't want NAFTA uh, to be uh, uh, blown up, they say this this is a very important thing. Yeah, he points out. Senator doesn't believe in uh, raising the minimum wage. Right. Right. Well, so I'm he, not sure he's what you call an advanced economic thinker. Well, the, the mayor points out $4 billion in trade uh, annually with just in the San Diego T1 region. I did want to ask you if businesses and local political leaders, such as, as Kevin Faulkner, are, are in favor in backing NAFTA, who's against it? Mostly the unions, mm -hmm. uh, and, and also environmental. environmentalists. Uh, yeah. Unions don't like it, especially the, uh, the auto industry, as I mentioned, but also the aerospace industry, not here in, not here in San, the San Diego area. They don't like it. Uh, the Teamsters, in particular, yeah, the, the truckers, truckers really don't. They like don't it. like it. They say that uh, it's it's unfair because they say that uh, the uh, trucks coming from Mexico are substandard compared to the United States, and also the truckers here in the United States have to uh, abide by tougher training licenses than the truckers in in Mexico. Their complaint, the Teamsters' complaint, is. Not the trucks going into Mexico, it's the trucks coming from Mexico into the United States. So there are winners, Tony. but there are losers of NAFTA. Mm -hmm. And as yep. you pointed out, the losers may have coalesced and helped elect the president of the United States. Yeah, because manufacturing jobs have been on decline. Now, you could make the argument, and economists do, how much did NAFTA accelerate that? And how much did NAFTA? Yeah, how much was it robots? How much it was a lot of other influences right. Precise. on Some that. of this was underway before right. NAFTA was right. started. I do think there's one interesting point Matt? that Rob alluded to about Congress. This is a big lift for Trump. As Tony says, yeah. a lot of his support, the reason why he was elected was because he said he was going to rip up NAFTA. That was one of his key mm -hmm. promises. But Republicans to, to, generally don't like to tear well, up trade agreements. to do that, he needs to get a, a yes vote in Congress. Right. He can't just unilaterally decide to, 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 to change this, either to rip it up or to make changes. And so... We just saw what happened with health care, mm -hmm. another big promise of his where he now has egg on his face, uh, although he can say that was their fault. This is entirely his administration, mm -hmm. his negotiators working with Canada and Mexico. This is his deal. Mm -hmm. It's on him to get it through. Mm -hmm. The other interesting Rob. thing that I think that's really important, especially when it comes to San Diego, is that um, is, is the, the aspect of Mexican um, energy reform. That's a very dramatic story that's really been underreported mm -hmm. in the United States. But about three years ago, Mexico decided to reform their energy right. industry, and companies like Sempra mm -hmm. Energy, here based here in San Diego, has made a lot of money, Benefit billions of dollars mm -hmm. through their subsidies, through, through their subsidiaries mm -hmm. in Mexico in, uh, in infrastructure. All right, we're going to have to leave it there, but we'll be watching and reporting and going on uh, with this as they move through the next few months and trying to renegotiate this. Well, it appears the critical documentary Blackfish has left a black mark on SeaWorld. The aquatic attraction on Mission Bay continues to see attendance dwindle long after the film condemning treatment of orcas at SeaWorld caused the park to end its controversial whale shows. 
So, Lori, I start with that attendance. What's happened to the attendance in recent years since that uh, that program? And that was about four years ago, that Blackfish. Yeah, uh, yeah 2013. Um, so, SeaWorld in its um, earnings reports never breaks down attendance by park. We do know last year that San Diego attendance was flat after sharply declining. But overall attendance continues to decline. It's also at their Orlando SeaWorld Park, um, not so much at San Antonio. And in San Diego, they're starting to see declines again um, and for different reasons. But they were very pointed in this last earnings report, uh, almost surprisingly so, that the, that the blackfish effect is still affecting them. They say that they had been spending more money than all their peers on marketing, and they thought that was helping, and so they backed off. That was a mistake. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't have. And so they're back with their advertising campaign, reminding people how what you know what a wonderful rescue organization SeaWorld is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if that marketing uh, can help turn the corner. Uh, it's a big issue. The CEO Joel Mamby, had, you would think he's done everything right to a degree. You know, they ban he announced a year ago that they're going to ban the breeding of orcas. They're going to phase out the theatrical Shamu show. That's gone now. The that, shows. Yeah, in San Diego not the other two parks, mm -hmm. and then align themselves with the San Diego Humane Society, one of their biggest critics. But mm -hmm. it obviously has not been enough, and this last earnings report with revenues and attendance down surprised even the uh, analysts who were expecting poor results. So right. what are the 10 Tony? orcas that are still there? What do they do all day? <laughs> they are, well, the, the, Can I go see them? the trainers will say that they're always being engaged. They, they have enrichment activities even when you don't see them mm -hmm. in, the, in these shows, and the, the new, if you, and they don't call it show, it's an educational presentation, it's called the Orca Encounter. And I mean, having seen it, I mean, true to their word, you are learning stuff throughout this presentation. Um, you have a National Geographic style documentary video above of orcas in the wild, and then they're showing you their natural behaviors. Um, and they're saying these sorts of behaviors and enrichment and playing and interacting with the trainers um, is goes on even even behind the scenes. So do they ride the orcas? No, no, not. that was gone long ago. That was right. after the 2010 dr down Drug, drowning yeah. death. Do that, they that have away. individual names anymore? They all have individual yeah. names. Corky yes. is still with us. Corky is still with us. The <laughs> oldest, the <laughs> oldest of all the orcas. Well, one isn't yeah. right. I mean, well, yeah, you had a story. So this week. yes, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, now, how many parks does SeaWorld operate, and is this a problem? A blackfish impact? Is that a problem throughout? Um, no, no. It, they have um, they have twelve parks, including some Bush Gardens parks. Uh, the only marine, the real marine parks are um, in San Antonio, Orlando, San Diego. The blackfish effect seems to have impacted San Diego more. In Orlando, the issue is more with foreign visitation is down. They have much bigger competition than San Diego does here. With they've got um, Disney Universal World. and Disney World. Yeah. They have, those are that's the big problem in Orlando. Blackfish is the problem is here in San Diego. On the market? Is it going to be sold? Um, uh, Joel Mamby will tell you, no, it's not. But they have hired, and they're not acknowledging this either. They've hired a firm that's known for that sort of thing, marketing a broker, company, big deals and, like that, yeah. and, and they won't acknowledge it. But they, they are. And and Berlin Entertainment, which owns Legoland here in Carlsbad, has said, gee, you know, we we'd be interested in buying the Bush Gardens parks. Hmm. Which makes you wonder who would buy the SeaWorld Park. Well, and their stock price has taken a hit too, right? Yeah, it's about twenty down twenty percent for the last right. uh, six months. So, and it, uh, it it's gone up a little since that last earnings report, but it's still not where it, where it should be. If you get far enough down, I mean, does bankruptcy come into the picture here? I guess I don't think so, and and maybe I'm believing what uh, Joel Mamby said in this last earnings call that there are ways to even further cut costs and make adjustments on capital expenditures. Although you never want to do that too much in theme parks when you need to keep introducing new attractions, but there are ways mm -hmm. around that. Um, so the the theatrical shows are gone, as you as you pointed out. What's really replaced them? How are, what are they marketing now that uh, they're trying to get attendance back with without well, seeing the Shamu shows? Well, probably going to be more next year for San Diego because the uh, the Orca Encounter. I don't know that it's going to be enough. They have some the new Ocean Explorer attraction that opened that's more for little kids with a submarine ride. But next year they're going to introduce the tallest, fastest roller coaster ever. Um, it's got it's, a great name it, too, doesn't it? Yeah, the Electric Eel. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and it's going to be, it actually, they're allowed to, uh, I shouldn't say violate, but they're allowed to go around the 30 foot height limit for like a couple Which attractions. So they're, it's going to go up 150 feet a second. Peter is still on their back to yeah, protesting every Yeah, they are. In thing. fact, um, on Saturday they said they are going to fly banners over all the beaches. Basically saying, uh, SeaWorld hurts orcas, don't go. 
Really? Yeah, so they, yeah, they are not letting up. I mean, Still doing those ads at the Lindbergh and, and they're taking, Lindbergh and they're not so much those anymore, but they're yeah. capitalizing on this death of Kasatka just a couple of days ago, the 42-year-old uh, whale. Yeah, I was just going to say, that, I mean, look, you think of SeaWorld, you think of killer whales, you think of orcas. That is their brand identity, mm -hmm. and now they're trying to change that, mm -hmm. and it's not going to work, because every time an orca dies in captivity, yeah. you'll get this... Uh, fur, you know, this uproar again. Yeah. And there have been three this year. Mm -hmm. And are they, are those deaths at all relatable, the fact they're in captivity rather than swimming off the coast? Um, I talked to a, um, a marine scientist and she said that she, she can't say for sure. She thinks that the stress of being in, in this more confined space can weaken the immune system, but she has no proof that that's the case. That's her speculation of what's going on. All right. Well, we'll certainly watch your reporting going forward and see what happens with SeaWorld and, and their attendance. Well, that does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Matt Hall of the San Diego Union Tribune, former LA Times reporter Tony Perry, Rob Nikoleski of the Union Tribune, and Lori Weisberg, also of the Union Tribune. Old times a week here with the Union Tribune. <laughs> Reminder, all of the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. Anytime you, wherever you are, you want to get your podcasts, you look for our Roundtable podcast. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on the Roundtable.